Welcome, everybody. You all enjoying the conference? Having fun so far? Brilliant. Uh, my name is Paul King. I'm the uh, tech lead for OCI for Groovy, and uh, I'm one of the big contributors to Groovy. So if you've got any questions about Groovy, come and uh, see me anytime throughout the conference. Always happy to uh, hear your thoughts or, or take any questions. Today, what I've got to talk on is um, it's about uh, testing with Groovy. And um, for my crimes, I've been involved with a lot of agile stuff and uh, as well as Groovy stuff for, for many years. And uh, I've got a lot of customers in, in close to where I live that are using Groovy uh, in, in many, many places for testing and in a variety of ways that you wouldn't expect. And there's some nice features of Groovy that actually enable that. But you know, the, the, um, the big thing is just, just by having a scripting language there, you open up a lot of doors compared to some of the other things, some of the other tools that uh, some of my customers use. So a lot of them are enterprise customers and traditionally have, have used vendor tools and they've been locked in and um, pretty much uh, only have available to them what those tools provide. So this talk's going to, it's, it's very broad. Uh, it's going to cover a whole lot of different technologies to give you a flavor of some of the things that you can do once you've got some, a, a scripting language. Many of the principles that I'm, I'm actually going to talk about are actually true of many scripting languages, but uh, Groovy is obviously one that um, I think is a, a, a very good one to pick if, you, if you're picking one. So the first question you might ask is, why test with Groovy? And I'd argue that, well, we shouldn't answer that question without a bit more context. So I'm just going to defer my answer. I mean, this is a room of friendly people. You're all going to say Groovy is just the most fun language to use. So there's, there's no question to ask. We're always going to use Groovy for testing. And um, that might be true in, in this room, but for many of my corporate customers, they have a lot of, uh, you know, some of them are conservative, they have lots of questions. And some of, some of the things that I tell them and show them and uh, the path that I lead them down might help you with some of your customers as well. We'll see. So the first thing that we should look at is just let's understand the whole sort of testing uh, area a little bit better. It's easy for us as developers to dive in and think, Oh, yeah, I've got to write tests, I've, I've learned all this TDD stuff or whatever, whatever the latest fad is, and I've just got to write tests. Um, but what I'm, what I'm uh, suggesting is have a bit of a think about exactly what it is you're doing uh, and in, in a, in a, across a variety of dimensions, and we'll look at some of those dimensions and um, hopefully get you to look at that. So let's, uh, let's drill down. We, Venkat told us uh, this morning to, be, uh, to simplify our lives as much as we could. So this is a simple diagram of what testing is all about. I've got something on a test, and I'm going to write a test to test it. What I'm going to say is that we've just gone and oversimplified it for, for, for many scenarios. So what I'd suggest is let's, let's drill down a little bit into those two boxes. So first off, the system under test. And this, uh, 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 this will be very basic for, for most of the people in this room. You'll know about different kinds of tests. But what I'm saying is just when you, before you dive in and start writing all your tests, have a little bit of a think about um, the different kinds of tests you might have. Start introducing some conventions and so on. This is not rocket science. Most of you are already doing this sort of thing. So you might want to tease out whether you're doing unit testing, integration testing, and acceptance testing. There's other names that we could use, functional testing and so on, but th uh, these ones are ones that I think are, uh, are useful. And the... Techniques and the tools that I'm going to describe over the, the rest of this talk, and there's a workshop tomorrow that dives into this in more detail. You can, you can play with all this stuff. Um, it's, it's going to be... Uh, some of those tools are going to be applicable across all those different kinds of tests, and some are going to be mostly applicable to certain areas. So if, if you're going to talk about mocking or something, it might not be used much on the acceptance testing end of this spectrum. And if you're using some of the other tools, it might, they might exist somewhere else and so on. So let's, let's have a look at this. Um, the second thing we should drill down a bit in is uh, the actual tests that you write. We, we very, as developers, we're keen to uh, type some stuff in and, and uh, run something as soon as we can, get a little green bar happening, whatever we want to do. Uh, it is useful just to stop and have a bit of a think about the, the components that at least conceptually exist when you're writing your tests. And I often find it's convenient to split out different parts. You've got sometimes different utilities. You might need to read an Excel file or something. It's just a utility. And depending on uh, 
we're going to, we'll, I'll get to that in terms of um, who the audience is for your tests as to what's, what's relevant. Um, it's useful to distinguish between what might be, uh, the, sort of the testing framework that you might be using to run your tests and any other helper stuff like drivers and things that you're using to interact with your application under test or your system under test. And it, it, in many cases, if you're just going to use go, uh, so there's another talk on right now on using um, Jeb with, with Spock to test web applications. Sometimes if you're going to go and do all those things, lots of pieces of this puzzle might be filled out for you. So it's, it's, it's not a case of you can go and um, change some of those necessarily. But just if you get that conceptually in your mind where these pieces uh, lie, it's going to help a lot to use some of the other things that I'm talking about uh, um, as, we, as we move along. We'll, we'll see that. Okay, now this is uh, probably more complex than we really need. It's just to give you an idea. When, when I'm um, thinking things through, I try to uh, have a fairly elaborate thing of how I'm categorising them all. For our purposes, we're going to write tests. We're going to have something that's going to be running those tests. I'm going to distinguish driver and test runners, and, and um, I'll tease those apart a little bit, even though sometimes it's the same bit of software. I'm going to talk about utilities, and again, there's a lot of overlap with these things, but th that's going to be good enough for us, and, and there's going to be different kinds of tests, and that, that'll be good enough. Sorry for, when it, when it gets projected up on the screen, the, the colours, I've got nice pretty colours on my screen, but they've just be, they're just a little bit too faint or something for this projector and it's, they've gone and be faded out. So you'll have to put, put up with a, a uh, slightly boring picture in some of the pictures. Some of the pictures it came out, some of them it didn't, so I don't know why. Now the other thing that I'm going to introduce is uh, talk about testing DSLs. And so we've just, um, a little nuance in, in this picture here, we've just got our tests what we're going to do is tease out a testing DSL. So we're actually going to write a testing DSL layer and our tests are going to make use of that layer and that layer will talk to the other things that we're, we're trying to do. And that, that can be a very useful thing. But I could give a whole talk on DSLs and, and, the, and there's, there's more talks on DSLs happening. There's been some, more, some already this morning and there's more uh, over the next coming days, I suspect. Um, we could spend a whole lot of time doing that Today is just a, a, a glance across DSLs as well. So if you don't know what DSLs are, domain-specific language is, is what it means. And what you're trying to do is create a little mini language, if you like, where writing the test is super easy. Okay? Now, why would you do that? Because I'm lazy as a developer and I want, to, I want my test to be nice and succinct and easy to write, easy to refactor. And you know, I might want to be able to swap out web driver and put in uh, HTML unit or whatever I want to do under the covers and, and I want to do that in an easy way so I can hide all that inside a testing DSL. Or I might uh, be targeting the audience of who's going to write these tests to someone who's not a hardcore programmer. So rather than using a low-level API to, to write web, web tests or database tests or whatever it might be, I can hide all the nitty-gritty details behind a nice friendly API and allow uh, non-hardcore developers to be writing the tests. And that might, A, it might allow a wider audience of people to be writing the tests, but B, it makes it much easier for me to show these tests to a, a business customer, show them to a client, whatever it might be. And, and that can be a very, very worthwhile thing as well. So, um, but again, depending on what your, who your audience is, you may not want to write a a testing DSL. If, if I'm doing unit testing and it's going to be developers who, who are writing the code for uh, the, the class under test and they're also going to be writing the test, I probably don't need a testing DSL. So depending on what the situation is, you might introduce the, the different concepts that we're going to look through. So now we can come back and uh, ask the question again, why are we using Groovy for this thing? And I'd, I'll still give a bit of a caveat. Well, it depends. Um, and you've got to ask yourself a few more questions yet, and, and we'll see those. It turns out there's many great reasons to be using Groovy. It's, uh, got, there's a whole uh, range of feature-rich frameworks. So we've talked about Jeb and Spock, but I'll, I'll go through the, the, uh, an overview of what some of the things are. You can script all things, which if you, we're coming into a world where everything's going to be 
uh, continuous integration, DevOps based. You want everything to be scripted. You don't want any manual tools that um, so, you know, a testing person or a non-testing person, anyone who has to go and uh, be um, using. So moving everything towards where everything is testable is just great. Having things to be open source and not link, locked into any vendor is, is, is a very good place to be. And as I said before, Groovy is great for writing, testing DSLs. We could, we could spend three days just talking about all the support that Groovy has for, for writing, testing DSLs. It's got um, all the way from some of its features for very, very dynamic programming all the way through to, to uh, very, very strong statically typed uh, testing DSLs that you can write. And there's a huge range of uh, libraries as well. There's a typo there. Whoops. Okay, so the first question that I'll be would ask is: Let's have a bit of a think about the fit. So, who, what kind of tests are we writing? If, if we're doing, as I said before, if we're doing unit tests, the, the people writing the classes, the people writing the tests are all you know Java developers, Groovy developers, whatever. There's not a lot of questions we need to ask. It, it'll, it might be very, very obvious what uh, frameworks we're going to use and the approach we might take. But um, you might find that you've got developers who are only familiar with, you know, they've, they've come from the uh, mainframe world or they're used to VB macros or something, and you want to get them to write your tests. And so if that's going to be the case, these are some of the things that you can, can look at. Now, there's probably not a lot of people in this room that fall into that category, but back in your organisations, if you've got an enterprise customer, you've got to sort of know about some of these concepts when you're selling Groovy into... In, into your organization and, and getting other people on board to the approaches you're taking. Have a bit of a think about testers and you know what, what kind of, um, are you gonna have BAs or subject matter experts reading these tests? Do you need to show them the tests? Do you need to show them the test output? And depending on what the answers to those things, it will depend on what uh, tools or reporting capabilities you might want. Okay, so what does Groovy give us? A whole lot of utilities, if you decide that uh, Groovy won't be the language you're going to write your tests in. Maybe you're going to have uh, subject matter experts fill out Excel spreadsheets. Heaven forbid, if that's what you have to do in your organisation, Groovy's got a whole range of scripting uh, libraries that let you read Excel and all that sort of stuff. So you can have that as your source if you need it. There's all sorts of regex utilities, there's all sorts of really useful libraries for just de dealing with combinations of things and so on. So there's a whole lot of utilities there. So Groovy helps with that. Great DSL support. We'll come and give you just a brief flavor of that as we go through the talk today. There's lots of debate in industry at the moment about statically typed languages versus dynamically typed languages. And there's, I think there's a place for having both of those things there. Gro Groovy's nice in that it, it uh, lets you uh, lie wherever you'd like to fit in that spectrum. It lets you uh, sit there. A place where very, very dynamic uh, code is quite useful, is, is very useful, is in the testing space. There's often a lot of glue code that you want to write for parsing stuff, for doing uh, some sort of mini, small layer between what you want to have of a friendly API and low-level APIs. Lots and lots of glue code. That's stuff you want, often, often want to write really quickly, often when I'm with a customer, I'm writing the testing DSL, pairing with the customer, sitting side by side. I want to be writing stuff really quickly. I don't want them to get bored and, and lose their train of thought about the, the thing that we're testing. So I'm, uh, while I'm capturing uh, requirements off the customer and, and typing them in, side by side I'm creating little testing DSLs and doing that in a super fast way, which I wouldn't be able to do with uh, other languages. So, so Groovy is really great for that. We've talked about... There's great uh, testing frameworks, Spock and so on. We'll see some of those. There's data-driven and property-based testing libraries. They're very, very handy. We, we'll, we'll briefly look at those. There's a whole range of um, drivers and things in the, in the Java ecosystem for talking to a whole range of systems. We'll have a brief look at those. So what I want to look at now is just drill down into the test runners. So most of you will be familiar with uh, the, the main ones here. So I'm, this is going to be a whirlwind tour. If you want more details of this, come and, come and see me afterwards. It's most of you, this uh, stuff will be very familiar with you. Okay, what kind of testing frameworks have we got? No testing frameworks. I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Various versions of JUnit, TestNG, and Spock. Most of you will probably gravitate towards Spock, but again, go back and ask the question, who's the target audience? 
if you are trying to bring a Java shop over into Groovy, ideally you'd like to eventually get them to Spock. That would, that's probably the nirvana of where you want to take them. That may not be the best first step. They may resist moving to, to Spock, and the fact you're trying to do Spock plus Groovy all at the same time might be just too big a jump. Going to JUnit 4 or 5 first, and then to Spock later, might be the way to bring those people on board. Now, what do I mean by uh, no testing framework? Well, Groovy thought testing was so important that it baked a whole lot of stuff into the language, so you don't need to go get a JUnit library or whatever, there's just stuff built in, and we'll see what that means. It's built in asserts, built in mocks, and there's a whole lot of bundled JUnit support and stuff, and uh, as we know, because of the ethos of lots of people who, who were using Groovy in the early days, there was a very strong ethos of, of Agile and testing people using it. There's frameworks like Spock uh, came to be, and a lot of us use those, that as well. So let's just have a look at what do we mean by uh, no testing frameworks. Well, let's just look at a little class that we might want to test. This is a little uh, temperature converter. So those of you, who, um, most people from Australia or Europe will be familiar with uh, the Celsius thing. If you're not familiar with, with Fahrenheit, any US people who are here will, will know what that is. Um, that's the, the, the difference between the freezing and boiling, say, in, on those scales. And uh, some of you may prefer uh, this description. Zero degrees in Fahrenheit means it's really cold outside. 100 degrees means it's really hot outside. 100 degrees Celsius, it's fairly cold outside. 100 degrees Celsius, you're dead because your blood's just boiled away. And if you're in Kelvin, you're dead on zero or 100 because <laughs> you're minus 173 or minus 273. So there you go. That's all you need to know about temperature scales. OK, so we're going to um, test our little converter here. And we don't need to have any testing frameworks. We just let's, let's just import that uh, class that we're going to test. And we can just write a bunch of assertions. OK, so we can write little scripts like this and get people to run them, and we've got testing done. Don't need to install any, you know, trying to get testers to go and in, install Eclipse, now put JUnit in your class path. Now, you know, it's, it's just a, a big rigmarole. If you just have a groovy console there sitting for them, type this in and run it. Um, you, you, you've got a much better chance of um, getting them to, to, to get stuff done. And don't, uh, it, it might sound like a very trite thing, but in some of the organisations that I've been in, there's been huge barriers that we've, just by having, uh, we've gone and installed Groovy console on the DBA's boxes or whatever. And the, the, in some of these organisations, there was political fights between all the different parts of the system. You've, you've all seen it before, all the different things that can happen. And we would go and talk to the DBA's and say, look, our, you, you promised to set the database up for us, we're, we're sending queries to you and they're not coming back. Um, and they would just say, oh, you've got, the you've got something wrong at your end. You've got the firewall screwed up or you've got the wrong drivers. You know, we've, we've gone and set everything up. And we could just go and email them a little Groovy script because we, we went and saw them before and installed Groovy console. They would cut and paste it, run it, and they'd say, oh, yeah, sorry, we forgot to do this, this little bit. And, and it just improved the, 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 um, the interworking between different groups as well. So don't, don't, don't uh, underestimate the ability just to have little scripts that are easy to run and you don't need to, with, all the, with the grab annotation and so on, you don't need to have them set up a whole lot of dependencies. It's just part of the, the script that you email them has all of that built into the, into the system. So it's, it's very, very powerful. Now, as you know, there's um, a power assert capability that actually um, arose out of uh, Spock and we thought it was so great, we thought, oh, we'll, we'll take a version of that and put it into Groovy um, as a whole. And so if I go and run an assertion and I've, accident, I've uh, accidentally put 34 there instead of 35 and I run that test, it'll come back and it'll show me what uh, the different parts of the, the terms um, evaluated to, and that can be very useful. So in that example, it was fairly trivial, but in this example, there's a whole range of different terms there you might not be able to read that from up the back, but there's a whole range of different terms, and I can see what the results for each of the different terms are. I can spot, ah, there's the error there. It's in those three terms, and then I can go and debug why is that happening. Okay, so we've got built-in assertions. Um, you've seen all this before, so I, I'll, I'll skim over these. So the, the, the code that's in here, it's not important that you're reading every single line or anything. All of this code is in a, a GitHub site 
that you'll have access to um, and it'll be what we're using tomorrow for the workshop. Um, if you want to go and look at any of this stuff, everything's on that GitHub site. So that's where all this stuff comes from. So the, the important thing about today is just the flavour of what, what, what's going on there. So Groovy just had a... It, it thought that testing was so important that we'd, we'd uh, give you JUnit bundle whenever you got Groovy, but we'd have an enhanced version of the test, uh, the, the test case. So Groovy supplies one of those, and it has a whole range of things in there. I'm not going to go into all the details. If you want to use JUnit 4, that's supported out of the box as well. JUnit 5, um, put in a couple of uh, grab statements or grab, put a couple of jars into your uh, class path and uh, off you go. You can go write JUnit 5 stuff as well. Um, and as, we've, as you would have heard, in, most of you all know in this room, every, who knows Spock in the room? Every, nearly, I can, one or two hands maybe, I haven't gone up, but you're probably busy answering emails or something. So most of you know what's, what Spock is. Um, yeah, so Sp Spock takes on board the, uh, some, some of the uh, emerging trends in the Agile area was TDD and then BDD. And it's all about, even when you're writing tests at the low level, and we're, we're going to be talking about trying to move higher and higher up the, the stack, even when you're doing a low level, trying to get the, um, a separation of concerns in how you express the test and so on. And using things like Spock with the BDD style helps you do that, you're pulling apart setting up versus what you're actually testing versus um, you know, um, some of the steps along the way and so on, teasing those out. And so Spock will let you do that. Okay. Now, both Spock and... Oh, you can also use TestNG. I, uh, there's samples of that on the, in, in that GitHub site. I won't uh, go into too much detail about that today. Um, all of those frameworks, so TestNG, all the versions of JUnit and Spock, all have uh, support parameterized or data-driven testing of various flavors. So for in, within JUnit, you supply uh, data in basically uh, uh, arrays of rows of data, and you can feed that into your tests. So here, on the, there's a con this is a class that happens to have a constructor, and which takes some parameters, and that's what uh, the parameterized runner that's part of the JUnit framework, it feeds in the, the arrays of the, the rows of data into a constructor and then the tests run. And the, the JUnit uh, framework uh, handles those as a, as a series of tests. So we, we get a couple of uh, different tests that get, that get run there. Okay, Spock also allows you to do that. It's got a very, very nice, friendly format for how you can um, uh, put the, this, the, the input data that you're feeding in here. So it's a nice little table of uh, rows of test data. So there's a header row, and then in this case, there's four different uh, things. There's freezing and boiling, that we saw those before, and then there's garden party conditions and beach conditions. I'm not sure what it's like outside. Is it close to... Garden party conditions? Maybe, I don't know. There's no wind factor there, so we'll have to alter this uh, example, won't we? Anyway. Um, and so if I go and run that test, it'll show me that, yes, the test ran, and all four, for that to have happened, all four of those uh, bits of data would have had to, to pass. Spock's got a really nice feature. Um, and so if, if you run this in your IDE, you'll, you'll just get one line saying that the test passed. Spock's got a really nice feature. You can add an extra unroll statement there. And if you do that unroll, when it runs that, it'll actually give you a separate test for uh, each of the rows of data. And that's really handy when you're visualizing what actually happened, what, what actually failed. And in this case here, I've gone and again, uh, unintentionally put 34 in instead of 35 as the appropriate temperature to convert there. And you can see that one of them has failed there. Now, Spock's also got a, a, a range of uh, mocking capabilities. So in this case here, we've got a, a purchase class that interacts with a movie theater class. And uh, we can create a mock for the theater. And we can uh, express what happens to the theater. We can then uh, call the purchase application with a particular method and then check what actually got called on the theater mock. Okay? And there's a nice little... Um, uh, 
it's a little mini DSL, if you like, a little uh, language for expressing the, what exp our expectations are with respect to how, what gets called. And it, it's showing you the method that got called, the arguments that were supplied, the cardinality, how many times things were called, and so on. So it's a, it's a very nice, succinct way of capturing that information. And um, there's some nice uh, whiz-bang features for, for doing wildcards and things in here, which I, I um, so it doesn't matter what got called as the, as the arguments in this, in this particular case, because I've got some underscores there. Okay, so in this case here, we're checking that, that no tickets were purchased under the conditions of, that we've gone and set up. Uh, here's another, another example that um, on couples night, we're expecting that the tickets that got purchased were in multiples of two, otherwise we haven't got uh, couples, we've got uh, a different arrangement of people in our theatre. And so that's uh, going to be captured in this particular t uh, mock there. Okay, now just a little tiny diversion on uh, assertion frameworks. So in, amongst the Java, the, the hardcore Java developers that I work with uh, quite regularly, they're always having these debates about which assertion framework they should be using. So there's people who like Hamcrest and there's other Fest and Google Truth and other things that um, people like. JUnit's gone and bundled part of the Hamcrest library in it as well. Um, just uh, trying to be a little bit controversial perhaps, but what I would argue is, is if you need an assertion framework, you're using a language that's not powerful enough. Why not use a powerful language and you don't need an assertion framework? The language that you're going to write your code in should be powerful enough to write your assertions as well as your code. And if you've got a powerful language, it'll let you do both. You don't need an assertion framework. Okay? Now, I'm being a little bit um, contentious there because there are certain scenarios where um, it, it can be quite valuable to have an assertion framework, but that what isn't how it gets used in 95% of the time. And I, won't, we can, we can I can take that offline over beers if anyone wants to, uh, to go into more details. So there's just an example of using an assertion framework and yeah, in Groovy, the way you would think about it is how you write it down and you don't need any uh, assertion framework. Um, many of the way you write it, many examples of how you'd write assertions in Groovy though won't lend themselves to static typing and that's, that's where you, an assertion framework can be useful. But you've, anyway, I won't, won't, won't dwell on that one. Let's uh, look at uh, drivers. I don't want to spend too long on this as well. Um, there's a Jeb driver talk going on right now and in the session after this as well and there's probably more talks on that uh, throughout the week. So it's, it's a great one to, to use but there's a, there's a, a variety of flavours that are out there. Um, so we're going to have a brief look at a few of those and we're going to use a little case study as part of uh, doing that example. And this is just a little uh, blogging application. It's actually, um, it's a, if, you're, if you've never played with GORM uh, outside of Grails, or who's played with GORM inside of Grails? See you. So most of you know what GORM's all about. If you've never played with it outside of Grails, go and, you can go and have a look at that little case study and it uh, shows you how you, you can do that. It's, um, it's not too hard. So there's, in a single file of, 90 lines, I've actually split it up to make it a little bit easier to read. But you can have a single file of about 90 lines that's this full blogging application with all the domain classes and everything all inside it. All the, the whole web app, the Jetty, fires up Jetty and all that sort of stuff. It's got all the, the CRUD operations for the web app all inside in, in not very many lines of code. So it's not important, so this is a really ugly looking interface on this app. There's no pretty CSS or anything but it's it suits the purpose of uh, explaining how web drivers work to the, up to a certain point and certainly for um, a, a fair bit of the uh, functional testing stuff that I want to talk about. I, I guess I should maybe do the little, uh, again, another little soapbox, a couple of minutes. Um, one of the, if you were at uh, Jeff's talk, um, he was talking about testing with uh, Grails. He would have mentioned uh, Jeb and using a HTML unit underneath it. Um, and I'm a big advocate of using things like HTML unit. But it's got its pros and cons and you've just got to be aware of those. So HTML unit is a browser emulator. It 
mimics trying to be a browser. And the good thing about that is you can run it on any platform and you can actually tell it to mimic other platforms and, and so on. But it is mimicking, it's not a real browser. So it turns out you could, I find for many of my customers what suits them and it'll depend on who your audience is and how important the visual uh, aspects of your website are. But depending on your audience, you might find that 90% of your tests you'd want to do using something like HTML unit, a browserless um, emulator. And then you might have 10% that just covering off, making sure that in a real browser it actually works and having a few of the more common browsers that your customer base will be using and doing a, a smaller range of tests doing that. You'll find that your test suites are much, much less brittle with an approach like that. But um, yeah, that's another soapbox thing. Another, another th we'll need more beers. We'll have, someone has to line up lots of beers with the pizza, I guess, for ha with the hacker garden, maybe. Um, so this, this is a little um, blogging application. It's got a range of posts there that it's displaying for us. We can enter a new post in. We can select, this is uh, using the Simpsons as the example. So Bart is uh, going to be writing a blog post and he can put a category in and some text and then he creates the post. And it'll create a new entry and it'll appear in the, in the list that we saw on this first page if we, if we refresh the screen. Okay, so that's our um, little case study. And what we're going to do is just look at a, a few uh, web drivers that you might use to test that. Now, um, if you're, again, if you're testing it into a, a, a database-centric application, you might want to have database drivers and other things that you're wanting to use here. You might be wanting to talk to a REST-based REST thing and so on. There's a whole range of things that you might uh, want to flick in here. This will just be about web ones. It's meant to be an example of... of uh, teasing these things out. So the first thing is, again, like we saw for web frameworks, you, you can get away with no, uh, uh, with test runners or test frameworks, you can get away with none. You can get away with no web, web uh, testing driver as well. And so how would we do that? Built into Groovy is the ability to go and get the text off a URL page. So we can just go and grab that, check it contains some values, do some regex tests on it, whatever we might want to do. Okay. Very low level, but we don't need a web testing framework if we don't want it. So we can do a small range of tests like this. Might be really good to make sure the website's up and running. Okay, it'll potentially be very brittle because I'm, if I've got HTML content or whatever, someone goes and changes the style on your page, some of these tests might break. So as we move towards the other kinds of tests we're going to talk about, you can raise your tests up some levels and uh, minimize the impact of making such changes like that. Okay, what can we do next? Well, built into Groovy is XML Slurper. And most HTML pages are very much like XML, so we can just go and slurp the page in and we'll be able to parse it, potentially. Now, some pages won't be, these days it's not, there's not, it's not too big an issue, certainly in the early days of the web, Many pages uh, weren't well formed HTML, and if you fed them into an XML parser, it uh, potentially could break. So this would be potentially brittle if, depending on uh, what how you generated your pages. If you're generating your pages in a way that guarantees that they're going to be well formed, then XML Slurper that's built into Groovy is is a way to go for certain things. One of the options, there's various libraries you can use that overcome that limitation of, of not, not well-formed uh, HTML on your pages. One of them is uh, Nico HTML, CyberNico. And um, it goes and tidies up slightly ugly HTML and, and uh, turns it into its best guess at what the, the valid form would be. Okay, so that's just showing you um, how you go and do that. Uh, typically, though, Oh, and there's HTTP Builder, and there was a talk on HTTP Builder Next Generation as well, so we could have another slide on here that uh, showed that example as well. You can go and use those as well to go and uh, get extract some content and do something useful with it. Okay, uh, Web Test is another testing library, so if you don't like um, Jeb or WebDriver or whatever, you can go use Web Test, and it's got an ant-based uh, syntax that you can actually write in Groovy, because Groovy supports ant builder. So again, this might be, if, if you've got some non-hardcore testers that you want to write your tests, you can uh, fairly easily get them to write tests like this. 
and it's just an, it, they can write it in XML if they don't want to, you know, heaven forbid, I don't know why they'd want to do that rather than Groovy. But they can go write it in XML, or they can write it in a nice friendly Groovy syntax as well, which has got much less sharp brackets to, so they won't cut themselves. Um, and they can do little tiny loops and things like that. You can uh, explain to that to them uh, fairly easily. And that's what uh, web tests will do for them. Um, it's the nice thing, web tests is getting a bit old. It's, it's not uh, keeping up with um, some of the other libraries, but some, it does have some nice things about it. It's got some really good reporting and there's some nice automated recording tools and things that you can use with it. But I'm not going to spend, I'm not going to try to sell you on web tests. As I said, it's getting a little bit old. Another option you've um, uh, got is HTML unit, which is what this example is here. But um, um, oh, this, is, this is Spock combined with HTML unit. And I've also got JUnit combined with, um, JUnit 4 combined with HTML unit as well. Now, this isn't a slide for you to memorize and, and try to replicate when you get back home. What you should be taking out of this is there's a fair bit of low level detail in the tests that I've got written here. Now that, if I'm going to write a very small number of tests, that might be fine. Um, if I'm going to be writing lots of tests, I'm going to be changing things over time and I want these tests to uh, remain in play for an extended period of time, this will potentially become brittle. And so the testing DSL layers that I'm going to talk about, um, and I'm going to uh, have to speed up or I'll run out of time, um, is going to allow you to write these tests that look much cleaner than that and won't uh, be as brittle. And Jeb, we've heard about that, is a good way to go. This is, Jeb is, if you like, a layer that sits on top of uh, HTML unit or WebDriver or these other ones that are available. This one happens to be using a, a, the Chrome driver in uh, WebDriver. But you could use HTML unit underneath this. So I showed you that little picture before, but in fact it's a little bit blurry as to what exists. So HTML unit, and WebDriver are fairly low-level drivers. Jeb is like a higher-level driver. It's already introducing a mini DSL, if you like, over the top of those lo more lower-level drivers. So you can either think of Jeb as a super driver that delegates to a lower-level one, or you can think of it as a mini DSL if you want. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll go and look at that. Even within Jeb, this is using Jeb in a very elementary fashion. And some of the things that I'm doing on here will, will be slightly brittle. I'm going and looking at the second uh, he, uh, H3 heading and pulling out the text. Now, again, if someone goes and reformats the, the styling on the pages, these tests might get a little bit brittle. Even within Jeb itself, there's capabilities to capture uh, in a declarative way, here's the, the new post page on my site. Here is the view post page on the site. And you just specify those declaratively, and then you can go and write a much more declarative test um, that'll be much, much less brutal, even within Jeb itself, without having to write even a yet an another higher level testing layer on top of that. Okay, so Jeb, Jeb's got a lot of uh, good things going for it, so it's a, it's a good option to choose. And as I said, you can fit HTML unit or one of the real driver uh, test, testing driver underneath, uh, underneath it. Quick look at testing DSLs. The main thing, then I want to spend the, uh, most of the rest of the time on a couple of the utilities. The, the things that you may not have thought of using that some of my customers have found very, very valuable, and it's because of the scripting capabilities that, uh, that uh, Groovy gives them that, that these things can come into play. So we're going to look at testing DSLs. And so to cut the long story short, we're trying to move away from the low level t DSLs like we saw on the, a couple of slides back. We're trying to move towards more higher level, like a medium level DSLs by you know, clicking a button named this or whatever, rather than going to this third heading and picking out the certain second one of those and so on. And we eventually want to move to sort of English looking statements, but not always. So again, it gets back to think about your audience. Every time you create a testing DSL, you're creating some code that has to be maintained. You've got to put work in there as the application evolves, you've got to maintain and change that testing DSL to, to mirror uh, what's actually happening with the application potentially. So you're going to introduce more work for yourself uh, in certain scenarios. So don't go and create a testing DSL everywhere. 
create it where it makes sense, where you need, need to have tests that are going to uh, be around for a while that you don't want to be brittle. Okay, now um, let's, let's just have a look at how we might go about creating a little testing DSL. So I showed you a few slides back, low level stuff, the, you know, talking at low level on a, on a page. What, we'll, what we do in a, in a testing DSL is start teasing the bits of that into little uh, friendly methods that you might, uh, how a business analyst might think about what's going on. So they don't, they're thinking about, you know, some, someone's entering something in the shopping cart, they're selecting an item, selecting a quantity, hitting add to cart or whatever. So in their head, they're thinking of three things, you know, select this, change this, click this or whatever. Why not have the methods that you're going to be calling with names like that? And that's what this is doing. What you're doing is creating little uh, methods that correspond to the, uh, what a subject matter expert would be thinking about you're trying to test or, or how your application is being tested. You tease those out, you put all the low level code inside one of those. What that means is if, you, if your website changes later on, everywhere that's going to, uh, to do with changing the quantity on the shopping cart, there's one place you go to, change a few little details in there, all your other tests are going to remain uh, working because you've gone and compartmentalized where that uh, low level detail is, is captured. So that's the first layer. Once I've gone and, and, and here's some more examples. So we've gone and put post blog, we'll create a little friendly thing called post blog and, it, and it's got some low level detail inside. We've got another one, check heading matches, some low level detail inside it. Just by creating those levels, we'll have gone from the low level DSL to the medium level DSL. The next thing we might want to do, and Groovy's really good at this, is create a little testing DSL. And this, this is one of the kind of DSLs that I'd go and create on the fly sitting beside the customer. It looks like there's a whole bunch of code there, but that's actually just boilerplate that I can generate. I can type in an English sentence, I've got a little utility I run, and it spits out those DSLs. And um, it's yeah, just boilerplate stuff that uh, then lets me write tests that look like that. Okay? And that's what my customers can write. And they can even make the, by using various tricks that, are, uh, that Groovy supports, you can make even the curly braces, the, the void test brackets curly brace at the, at the top and the curly braces at the bottom, you can make all that disappear right, by uh, injecting various things into scripts and so on. And so uh, Groovy's got really good support for that. You can make the slashes on the end of lines disappear and so on. So there's a whole range of different things you can do. And, and that becomes the test that the testers will be writing. Or the developers are writing if that's uh, the people who are writing it. Okay, final topic is testing utilities. So now that we've gone and created these testing DSLs, what we've got is these, uh, so probably the, we've got, I'm mostly talking about, we've gone and created a medium level one here. I can now go and fire a whole range of things into this testing DSL that I've gone and created. And let's go and look at some of the things that we can do. Built into Groovy is uh, all combinations. So if I'm filling out a web form, I can just go and say, yeah, there's the, this is a drop-down box with three, three values. This is another drop-down box with two values. This is a date that can have these values in the month, these values in the year, or whatever it's going to be. And then I can just go and say, now give me all the combinations of that. And Groovy will automatically generate every single combination. And you can just fire that into your testing DSL layer. Right? So it's just uh, a couple lines of code, and you've done that. Now it turns out that that might generate many, many, many tests for you, and you may not always want to do that. And that's when we're going to look at all pairs that can uh, simplify your life, and then we'll look at these other ones. So um, here's uh, all combinations. Now, this is a, a uh, fictitious example. You might have operating systems, memory sizes, and disk, disk space sizes or something. You could go and, uh, what I've seen people go and do is hire testing consultants and they've realized they've got a combination, combinatorial problem and they go and get the, the, the test consultants to write out the combination of all these as individual manual tests. And I just sit there banging my head against the wall. Okay, so you just spent you know, eight weeks getting the test developed to write these out. Okay, so when, when uh, the memory size changes from eight gig to 16 gig in a year's time, 
what are you going to do? You're going to go hire those test developers and they're going to come back in and they're going to charge you the same eight weeks and they're going to regenerate the same manual things all over again. You're going to throw away all these ones and you're going to... So if you go and leave it in the form that's actually capturing what the problem is, that I've got the combination of these things, you just go and change this. Oh, put 16 gig in there. And the test suite just runs with 16 gig in there and it generates all the values that you need for 16 gig and, and your test suite just captures all that. So you can do that. Uh, combinations... Um, and so for, for our blogging application, for BART, we've, we've got BART, Homer, Marge, and so on. We've got school, travel, food as, as categories. We've got some sample. Um, we're going to just go and fire three different uh, titles for the blog entries and so on. It'll come up with 75 combos. And it's just, it's just that one line of code that you see there. So just dot combinations. Um, you may not want to fire 75 combinations of tests. What it turns out is that usually when bugs occur in your application, it's because of two features that are interacting that you didn't factor for. So you'll have a test somewhere deep in the bowels of the code. If the first name's not null, then get the first letter of the first name and the first letter of the last name, and they'll become the initials. And you forgot to check that the last name wasn't null as well. And it's, so it's only going to be when you set the last name as to null and you're also setting the first name or whatever, when that, when that combination of things is occurring, that's when the bug is going to surface. At no other time is the bug going to surface. So you can get really, really good coverage in your test suites, not by doing all combinations, but just making sure that every pair of possibilities is covered somewhere in a test. And there's libraries that generate all pairs for you. And there's one... Uh, that's, there's a small groovy file that has an all pairs algorithm in it, in it that um, I'm using in this example. And it, instead of doing 75 combinations, we've now only got 18 pairs. And you can see that Win95 is got every memory size. For you. So if you follow up and down for Win95, you'll see every memory size is covered, every disk size is covered. If you go to Windows 2000, every memory size is covered, every disk size is covered. Right, but not all combinations are there. It's only 18 instead of 75. And again, you don't need to go and get a test specialist to go and work these out for you. It's just one line of code saying dot all pairs instead of dot all combinations. And now your test suite will be running all the time, generating things. And you can augment the algorithms that you get for all pairs. You typically can augment them and say, but also always run this case because it's, it's a frequent one that comes up. So even if it's not one of the ones that your algorithm generates, always run this or never run this or you can, you can tweak the, how it generates the things and so then instead of having 18 pairs, you might have 23 pairs or something, but instead of 75. So keep that in mind. The fact that we've got scripting there allows us to do this. Okay. The next thing I want to look at is property-based testing. And if you've got a team of developers that have uh, moved into functional programming, some of them might uh, be um, hassling you about all the kinds of TDD style of testing that we will typically do. You typically don't do that for uh, functional programs. So in, in Agile, we have this little game where you, you, know, you don't write a single line of production code until you've got a failing test and so on. And what, what that's actually doing is you're actually doing some grey box testing by doing that approach. You know that I really need to do an if statement here or a while statement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some uh, pairs of tests that are going to force an if statement to be written to make certain certain uh, things are covered. And it turns out if you've got a functional language, there is no if statement inside there. You'll have captured that in a different way. And so they typically use a different approach, and it's called property-based testing. And what that means is instead of actually um, having a whole range of handcrafted tests, you have a whole bunch of generated tests. And there's pros and cons to both. So don't, some uh, functional advocates will tell you that all you need is property-based testing and all this other stuff, the TDD stuff we've done in the past is crap. That's not quite true. Um, but there's some really good value in uh, property-based testing. Just to show you some examples, uh, for words in some non-empty lists of strings, assert that if I take all the words, and find their individual sizes and then add them up, it'll be the same as if I concatenate all the words and then find the length of the concatenated thing. Okay, so what's this thing here? It looks like it's, I'm calling some method call. It are actually, there's actually generators 
that come as part of your property-based testing framework. And this, that's a generator that's going to give me non-empty lists of strings. Okay? And there's a whole range of different generators. So going back to our little Celsius converter, we can go and do a couple of different property-based tests for that. Now, you might think, so the example that I did originally, I said, oh, let's do freezing, let's do boiling, let's do garden party, let's do, what was the other one, beach conditions. So I put in four tests, and as a tester, I went and manually created those four tests. Property-based testing, you don't create any of those tests. So you randomly generate values. Now, that's got some consequences. If I'm going to be randomly generating the value, how do I know what the expected one is? Okay. Sometimes I'll have some sort of um, uh, oracle that I can go to. I might have an external temperature converter that I can go to the, off the web or something, and I'll compare what my system's generating with something that I trust. Sometimes you can do that. But often you, you, there is no way to actually generate the expected value. So instead of trying to match expected values, you just try to convince yourself that certain properties that you expect to hold still hold. So what we can do is, for this Celsius calculator, what we can say is, well, I know what free, freezing, boiling, uh, the, the different phases. So we've got liquid, uh, solid, and gas for, for, for the temperature range for water. I know that if I had something that was in liquid state in Celsius, it better be liquid state in Fahrenheit. It just makes sense, right? And if it was liquid state, if it was boiling state, in, so it's gaseous state in Fahrenheit, it better be gaseous state in Celsius. So I can ex capture what those conditions are and then just say, make sure that uh, the, when I'm in the liquid um, for Celsius, I'm in the liquid for Fahrenheit as well, and just run that. And it goes and runs that over whatever random values it generates. And it, it can generate uh, whatever. We, we're doing 100 here, but we could do a million if we wanted to. And it'll just go randomly generate values and it's checking certain properties. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll quickly just show you one more example of this and then go on to the next one. Um, this is another example of a property, and this, this one's using a Spock Genesis property-based testing. So if you like Spock, you can go and uh, augment that with this particular Spock Genesis, and it'll let you do this property-based testing with Spock. And in this case, what we're going to say is, in the range of values that we know about, and if you're at minus 273 or, or you're at 999, you're in big trouble again, going back to that little chart. Um, but regardless, if you've got a, a, a value uh, in that range and I pass it through the converter, if, or if, actually if I, if I do two of them, if the Celsius temperature was above the Fahrenheit, uh, if, I've got two, if I've got two temperatures and the Celsius one of one of my temperatures is above the Celsius, then the Fahrenheit better be above the whatever the Fahrenheit gets converted to. So if all of a sudden they got flipped over, there's something wrong with my converter somewhere. So I've, this is another property that I'm expecting to hold, and I just say go, and I can, uh, this one's running it with 100 tests, and it'll, if that ever fails, I know I've screwed up my Celsius convert, my temperature converter somewhere. Um, so look at, have a look at property-based testing. GPARS, uh, Venkat just gave a, a nice talk on, uh, on GPARS. If you want to do a whole range of tests in parallel, here we're going to go and test the blogging application. We can do it in parallel, and all of a sudden, uh, I've got parallel threads all hitting my website, and, and, and the tests are all happening in parallel. Okay, easy to do. One, one, one or two lines of code. You can use logic-based uh, libraries. So some of you may not have thought of this, but some of my customers have got properties. They know about the. Uh, uh, their web clients. And in this particular case, for the blogging one, um, we know that looking at the, uh, the people that come into the blogging site, they never blog on the same day. Marge blogs only on a Saturday or Sunday, and so on. We've got the range of conditions. You can go again, you can go and hire the test analyst, tell them all the stats that you've, you've, you've teased out of um, your analytics, give it to them, and they'll create a manually handcrafted set of tests for you. Or you can express it in a constraint language, go and tell a constraint library to solve it, and it'll come back and say, ah, yes, there's only um, four solutions that match the data that you fed into me. So you fed in all this analytics data, here's some test data that matches the conditions that you fed me. 
and you can go and feed these conditions into your test suite. And again, you don't need to uh, have your test analyst there. We, I'm not, not against test analysts, but get one that writes groovy, that's all I'm saying, right? And then your data changes, your analytics change over time, you just go and tweak the, the formulas that you're feeding into this, and then new test data starts coming out of this that, that tests these conditions. Model J units, another one that you can go use, where you create a little state machine uh, for your system, and once you create your little state machine, you just go and run it. And in, in this case here, there's a vending machine example there, but I'll go to the blogging one. In our little blogging one, we, here's our little machine that we're going to create. And what we do is then we just say run it, and what it goes and does is it runs the blogging application, and in this case here, what we're doing is we're, we're checking uh, what happens if I do drop down A first and then drop down B, or I could have done drop down B and then drop down A. Is that going to screw up my uh, how the different things in, in my website are going to work or not? So I've gone and made a little state machine that shows how people can interact with my page, and then I go and fire it off, and it creates a whole bunch of tests, and then it shows me little graphs. Okay, I've got... I've, of the model that you fed me of your web page, I've gone and got this much coverage, making sure that I've got, have I got all the possibilities of all the ways that people can come in and interact with your page or not? And these little state machines give you that data. So there, there are a, a bunch of um, little techniques that you can use that having a, uh, a language there, um, a scripting language there, makes it really, really easy to do. Okay, if you're interested in any more of the details, as I said, there's a GitHub site and it goes and lists. You might have thought that was a whirlwind tour. I showed you a whole range of different things. There's about four times as much as that in the GitHub site, different frameworks and things you can go look at. I've just, just cherry-picked out some things that I thought you might be interested in. Go and have a look at those. If you, so I like, had one slide on Jeepers. If you want to go and see examples of how Jeepers can be used for testing th this uh, web application, go and have a look at it. Model J unit, all the codes there. If you want to see what, what did I actually mean by that little state machine, what would it mean for a little blogging application, you can go and have a look at the code and have a think about how that might be relevant in, in some of your applications. Okay, so what are some of the um, take home messages? We're trying to create little t testing DSLs, moving things up the stack to make our tests less brittle, but don't do it necessarily everywhere. Have a think about who the audience is for your, for your tests, who are the people who are going to be maintaining these tests, who, who needs to read them. Uh, who needs to write them, and, and so on. And there's a lot of techniques that, you know, that I, I was having a go at some test analysts, but uh, I've got a lot of respect for the good ones, and they learn a whole lot of stuff that us as developers don't learn. So go and, and some of the things that I was telling you about are some of the stuff that's come from, uh, from testing analysts. So go and have a look at some of those things like all pairs testing and so on. That's bread and butter for a test analyst. But as a programmer, I, I, didn't, I knew nothing about it through all of my degrees. And um, there's lots of stuff that, that they can uh, give you. Go and start using some of that in your test frameworks as well. Okay, thanks very much.